Today I'm going to tell you the story of how the most hated man on the internet almost became an LCS owner before then getting arrested by the FBI and ending up in federal prison. Yeah, another case of the FBI influencing the world of League of Legends. It's a wild and crazy ride that I am very excited to take you guys on, but before I do, I want to give a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, Opera GX. Before I go any further, let me just say, I've taken a sponsorship from these guys in the past, which was for the same reason you take any sponsor. They had a cool product and wanted to give me money. But since then, this browser has actually turned into such a cool thing, I legitimately use it every day. It has tons of features to enhance PC performance, like GX Control, which shows you how much processing power is being taken up by tabs and allows you to manually adjust how many resources your computer dedicates to running your browser itself. There is also an incredibly useful setting here that allows you to force all sites you visit into dark mode. How neat is that? There's also tons of other features like Twitch and Discord integration, so you can cut down on running extra programs on your PC, having them all here in one easy to access place. But by far, my favorite thing that they added recently is this new feature called GX Player, which features Spotify, Apple Music, and other audio streaming integration. What's so neat about this is not only do you get to, again, cut down on running extra programs, but if you do something like start watching a YouTube video while you're listening to music, your browser will automatically pause the song you're listening to until your video is done and then automatically resume it once the video is over so the audio Audio doesn't layer on top of itself, but you don't have to manually pause and unpause your music over and over and over. There's really so much here. Opera just keeps on blowing me away with this stuff. I haven't even mentioned all the cool gamer customization you can do if you want to really make the browser feel 100% your own. But all of this is completely free to use. If you want to try it out yourself and see if it lives up to the hype, you can do so with the link in the description down below. Seriously, big shout out to Opera here. Thank you for sponsoring me. Please sponsor me again. But anyway, let's Let's go ahead and get back to the story. If you spent any amount of time on the internet in the year 2015, you probably recognize this person, Martin Shkreli, otherwise known as Pharma Bro. Martin Shkreli was an American hedge fund manager and co-founder of a pharmaceutical company who kickstarted one of the biggest healthcare scandals of the 2010s. At one point, he was named the most hated man in America. But what many people don't know about him is at the exact moment he was becoming the face of everything wrong with healthcare in the US, he also had an esports team that came a hair's width away from making it to the LCS. Yeah, this is a pretty crazy story, but to get to the League of Legends part, we have to go all the way back to the very start. Martin Shkreli was born on March 17th, 1983, to a pair of Albanian immigrants in New York City. He had humble beginnings growing up in a working class community as his parents were janitors. I mean, he did not come from wealth by any means, but he would manage to work his way into it before long. After graduating high school and college, Shkreli would eventually make his way to working on Wall Street for a couple of hedge funds. This included some time at Kramer Berkowitz and Company, yeah, he worked for that crazy guy who yells on TV all the time, and managed to find a lot of success there. At one point, he made a trade that made so much money and was seen as so prophetic that the Securities and Exchange Commission investigated his knowledge to see whether or not he participated in some sort of insider trading, but they were unable to prove any wrongdoing on his part. Shkreli continued continued to work on Wall Street for a while, eventually starting his own hedge fund named MSMB Capital Management. This hedge fund was run a little differently compared to many others out there, where in particular, according to an article by Vanity Fair, one of the ways that Shkreli's company allegedly operated was by shorting biotech companies. In other words, they were betting that these stocks would drop in price and go down because these companies weren't actually all that good. But what made this interesting was after taking a position, Martin Shkreli and his firm would then go on to online stock trading chat rooms and describe all the company's flaws in the hopes of enlightening everyone about them, causing their stock price to go down. I mean, in other words, it kind of sounds like MSMB was trying to use the equivalent of YouTube comments to run their business. Shkreli's a really interesting character. He would later be described by columnist Adam Feuerstein as intelligent, but too immature and unfocused for the job of CEO. Even so, he seemingly found a lot of success with various different
different companies throughout the 2000s as he amassed a decent amount of wealth and did two very important things relevant to this story. Firstly, he started a healthcare company named Turing Pharmaceuticals, which was a firm that had a business model of obtaining licenses for medications whose patents had expired and then reevaluating the pricing of them in the hopes of finding some sort of huge price discrepancy that could give them windfall profits. The second thing he did was he started playing League of Legends. I don't think we know for certain when, but at some point past 2011, Martin Shkreli started playing League and loved it. He'd grind the game regularly, getting decent enough to get gold rating in Season 6 on an account named Turing Boss. He would eventually stream plenty of his games online, but wanted to do more than just play soon enough. In particular, it seemed as though Shkreli wanted to enter the League of Legends esports scene, so in 2015, he would go on to found an organization named Odyssey Gaming, which would compete in the North American Challenger circuit. This team was surprisingly talented for being so new. In particular, the org was able to sign Inori, who played jungle for them, as well as Steelback, who played AD Carry, two players that would go on to have decently long and successful careers in the LCS and LEC, respectively. Perhaps it was this raw talent that allowed them to do pretty well in the first two events they entered. To make the North American Challenger series, though, the league one step under LCS, Odyssey would have to win an online qualifier, which they first tried entering in the summer of 2015. Here, they showed that they were pretty talented getting some early victories, but were eventually eliminated by Cloud9's B team, Cloud9 Tempest, before making it too far. This meant that Odyssey would be unable to participate in the 2015 NACS Summer season, but that didn't deter Shkreli. Shortly after Odyssey failed to qualify, Shkreli went on to go and merge his team with another squad that was already in the NACS named Team Magnetic. With this merger and Shkreli now taking over as chairman, the organization would rename itself and rebrand to being Team Imagine, and this squad might have been talented enough to make it to the LCS. The team included some of the old players that had previously played on Odyssey, like Inori and Steelback, but also included some of the stars from Magnetic that had been there before the name change, the most notable of which being a young Biofrost. It's kind of shocking looking back at how much talent surrounded this team, which probably contributed to them eventually making their way to getting third place in the summer split. This qualified them for the playoffs afterward, where they just needed to make top three here to be guaranteed at least reaching the 2016 spring promotion. When playoffs began, Imagine had to start off by going up against Renegades, which was an incredibly talented organization run by Monte Cristo, with tons of veteran players who had already played on League's biggest stages. But even so, after dropping Game 1, Imagine managed to destroy them Game 2. A really good push goes in towards Maple. Black Shield used after the slow lands, and Maple has to burn Flash, but might There's still no go mana. down. The late ulti pop, the slow is enough. There's the kill, and now Romilia. So screwed. Kill comes around nicely ganked. Imagine your one good shockwave kills him. The hook lands on Alex. Black Shield's already on. In comes Meganar. Only gets a couple, though, and Chucky Fresh kills off Alex Hitch. Baby in the front line still survives, but in comes Romilia. Not doing nearly enough damage. Everybody getting evaporated. A perfect team fight for Imagine. Clean ace. Chucky Fresh Got even it. here. And that's going to be imagine taking the adaptation from game one, bringing it into game two, and Renegades look like they were the team that didn't know how to take these fights all throughout the game. After game two, Renegades would come back into form and win the final match, taking the series, which sent Imagine down to the third place game. Here, Imagine still had a decent chance at winning their way to a promotion series, as all they would have to do is win a single best of three to qualify, but this would still turn out to be a bit of a challenge as they would be facing C9 Tempest, the team that knocked them out of the NICS qualifier not long ago. Perhaps some of these players remembered that, as they seemingly played their tails off trying to get a win here. One down to the bottom right. He's gonna go from the minions to the bottom side. He's going from the minions to the bottom. Okay, here he goes. The ulti comes in from Brom. They want to knock down Solo. He ults out. Takes there the he hand. is. And here's the push on in. He chooses to go for the Olaf. Gets the fear on the oh, four of them. Oh, oh. It's a slaughter right now. Team Imagine pushing in three for one so far. Moon kiting in towards Lod. Lod can't do enough here. Ren's already on cooldown. Four kills picked up. Yasui. A lot of damage put on. And Sheep's gonna be in a really bad spot. Ults in and gets ulted out. He's gonna look for Solo going down. The one for nothing. The goal for this next the second chase is here, and Lod's gonna lose his life. Three kills picked up already. Imagine cannot lose a team fight. Imagine trying to back right now. Steelback coming up the side. 
They have to give this up. This is just going to get destroyed right here. Unless they can get there in time. They've got the oh, flank from oh. Blitz, so they push on in. He's Where? doing it. Oh, he's going to go down to, to the deal. side. Plans of the way. Looks for Solo. Takes a lot of damage. He's got to kite this properly. He will do so. Rend is down. Can't quite land it. Here comes Chunky Fresh. There's the knockback. There's the double kill. An ace, a belated ace for Imagine. Full build at this point, honestly. Here comes the push for turret number one. This could mean the promo tournament. There goes turret number one. 20 seconds and Yasui's respawn. The stun towards Chunky Fresh, but they're ignoring the champions. Turret number two is down. The knockback to buy some time. Explosive cask is down. Steal back safe. That's, That's gonna, gonna be, be the game. Imagine make the comeback happen. 2-0, and they're in the promo tournament. Imagine for a moment popping a pill before bed that costs about $13.50. Now imagine waking up the next morning, find that the price of the exact same pill jumped to $750 overnight. The anger aimed at one man, the 32-year-old hedge fund manager behind the price hike, defiant until now. In September of 2015, Martin Shkreli and his company, Touring Pharmaceuticals, raised the price of a drug named Daraprim from $13.50 a pill to $750 a pill. Daraprim is a drug that was most often used as an antiparasitic to treat AIDS patients with toxoplasmosis. In spite of the fact that this drug had no improvements or changes to necessarily provoke a price increase, the cost per pill shot up overnight and kickstarted a bit of a national discussion about the healthcare system in America. Now, the US healthcare system is pretty weird. It's way beyond the scope of this video as it's a pretty big, complicated mess. But all you need to know relevant to this story is because of the system the US chooses to use, Americans pay more per capita than any other nation on earth for their healthcare, even though a lot of people don't have quality care. A lot of people don't have any health coverage at all or are underinsured and can't pay for a lot of things that they need. It's a pretty common occurrence to see people either go bankrupt from medical bills or even die sometimes because they can't afford care. Possibly the biggest point of discussion that comes up when debating healthcare though is drug prices. If you take a look at any drug, the exact same pill sold overseas will almost always be multiple times cheaper compared to when it's sold in the US. Daraprim, for example, was already sold for pennies or maybe a few bucks per pill in most other nations on Earth compared to its relatively high price in the US of $13.50. That was already kind of messed up, but to see things go even further, it just enraged the country. For the average American to open the news one day and see that a millionaire pharmaceutical CEO raised the price of a life-saving drug medication over 5,000%, well, that was enough to set people off. In response, Martin Shkreli would have to go on a bit of a media tour, going to various different television shows to discuss the reasoning behind the price increase. It's in fact a very short uh, treatment administration, which makes it even less expensive than most orphan drugs, which you have to take for years and years and years. Can you imagine taking a drug that costs $500,000 for the rest of your life every single year? For, by comparison, a cure, a cure treatment of Daraprim is about $50,000. It's about half the price of uh, Hep C uh, cure regimens right now. Honestly, Shkreli gave some solid answers here and provided a lot of detailed explanation when pressed on any and all of these issues, but these interviews probably did him more harm than good. In each appearance, Martin always came off as a kinda slimy, spoiled rich kid. I mean, his demeanor didn't really have a lot of humility to it or understanding, which is what many people kinda started calling him. I mean, people started insulting him. At, at one point, the then presidential nominee Donald Trump said that he was just a spoiled rich kid. His whole demeanor came off as someone who was callous and a bit harsh or rude to others. If you one more question, you know, in response to all of this attention and doctors and patient groups saying they can't access this drug, are you gonna change the price? No. He really seemed to have a bit of a brash personality, but eventually a few people started to kind of like him. As weird and harsh as he could be, there was a bit of charm to his character in an odd sort of way. In the way that he dressed, in the way that he talked, he kind of seemed as though he was the personification of the internet at times, as if the internet was a human being. He lived in an apartment that resembled a college dorm, more so than a millionaire's New York City abode. He went on to 
buy a one-of-a-kind Wu-Tang Clan album for about $2 million at auction, and seemingly always engaged with his followers and fans on social media. He would post to Twitter and Facebook all the time and gave opinions on the stock trading subreddit Wall Street Bets so frequently that they eventually made him a moderator. I don't want to say he was necessarily a good guy or anything like that, but there was a weird likability that he had. He was what I think a lot of people imagine that they would behave like if they were a rich person, kind of an average internet dweller who just happened to have a lot of wealth. And like a regular internet dweller, he did a lot of regular person things like play League of Legends. That's the most interesting part of all of this to me. This Daraprim controversy that we've been talking about for so long and that you probably saw on the news if you watched the news in 2015, this was all happening right when Shkreli and his team were about to play in their promo series to the LCS. If he watched these matches live, he may have very well watched it between doing a number of different interviews on all sorts of different TV stations trying to defend himself and his company. Team Imagine would end up having to face off against Team 8 in their best of five series, which this team was the only thing that was preventing the most hated man in America from becoming an LCS owner for possibly years to come. So right now, teammate actually have a slightly more team fight power. We'll see how it goes right now. Chunky Fresh on the back, takes a lot of damage. He runs out the exhaust. Moon goes down very quickly. Good damage from Golden Glue. Kali Trolls gets out with a sliver of health, but can still offer the ultimate if he needs to to Nian, and he will do so. Saves that on a Man Cloud. Man Cloud thinks it's going to be a lot coming in. Oh my God, he so turns. Moved. He knows he can get the kill, but it was too little, too late. Oh, he it's changed his where he sometimes got himself in trouble in the beginning. Zanyas goes out. He's pretty big right now. Huge shot from the end to take down Moon. He's a big initiator as well, being in the all damage Eve. So if these guys go down, the rest of the line is going to fall back. And a 14,000 gold lead as they pressure down onto Imagine's base. Chunky Fresh, not the initial hit they want. The cocoon hit. Oh, oh the shot. Whoa, Dodo goes in. The ball delivery cow ball. And that's Cali Trolls coming up with a kill along with Dodo. A few more start racking up for the team. Golden Glue picks up a double for himself and a picture perfect initiation that only missed Steel back because he was too far back. Gives Team 8 the base. They start to turn it to shambles and Team 8 will retain their spot in the North American LCS. Team 8 ended up beating Imagine three games to one and sent them back down to the NACS. If you're one of the many people out there who really did hate Martin Shkreli, you have these five players to thank for him not being an LCS owner today. Now, as much as I may have tried to paint Martin in a somewhat sympathetic light here, it turns out a lot of people in the League of Legends community did not like Shkreli at all. A little while later, it came out that Shkreli reportedly owed some $75,000 in back pay to various different coaches and players in the league scene. It seemed like there were multiple different circumstances actually where he was trying to make his way into both the NALCS and the EU LCS as an owner and he had owed a fair chunk of change to a number of different staff members and players across the two regions. Shkreli apparently didn't respond to comment when questioned by various news publications when all of this broke, although there may have been a reason for that. Federal officials are holding a press conference at this hour after arresting Martin Shkreli. He is now free on $5 million bond this morning after being arrested for fraud. In December of 2015, just a few months removed from nearly making LCS, Martin Shkreli was arrested by the FBI for securities fraud. The US government claimed that while he was at MSMB Capital, Shkreli had been running his company like a Ponzi scheme, taking money from one organization and using it to pay back investors in another. The government also alleged that Shkreli lied about the fund's performance and defrauded investors. None of this had anything to do with Daraprim's price high controversy, but a lot of people saw this as an opportunity for a bad person to get their just desserts. The court case moved really sluggishly as jury selection took forever since it proved really difficult to find any unbiased jurors. I want to read you a little quote here from Wikipedia that compiled a few of the comments that a number of potential jurors made. Due to Shkreli's notoriety and overwhelmingly negative public opinion, it was difficult to select an unbiased jury with potential jurors stating, I'm aware of the defendant and I hate him. He kind of looks like a dick 
and he disrespected the Wu-Tang Clan. Shkreli would argue that he didn't commit a crime because he didn't actually lose any of his investors' money. All of his investors that had invested in the fund in question either broke even or made money, and therefore he must have not broken the law. But he would later go on to be convicted of two accounts of securities fraud and one account of conspiracy to commit securities fraud. Eventually, Shkreli would be sentenced to seven years in federal prison, which that's where he is today. During his sentencing, the judge said that Shkreli seemed genuinely remorseful and reportedly had tears in his eyes, apologizing for some of what had transpired in the past few years. Honestly, I don't really know what to make of him as a person. I don't really think he deserves the title of most hated man in America, but then again, he's still at the center of some pretty weird news even today. He's most recently had a lawsuit come his way that claims he allegedly has been trying to corner a drug market even now while he's still in federal prison. My favorite Shkreli story though has to be, apparently one Bloomberg reporter fell in love with him after reporting on his story and then went on to divorce her husband, quit her job and freeze her eggs for him. And when he gets out of jail, all before he dumped her through a statement from his lawyers. Shkreli and his story are just one of the weirdest things that I think I've ever seen when it comes to internet history, and I can't believe he almost became a team owner in the LCS. Love him or hate him, he absolutely would have been an entertaining owner if nothing else, and in some other universe, maybe he made it there.